Our speaker today, Steve Pinker, uh, is professor of psychology at Harvard University. He was previously at MIT, uh, and he is from uh, Montreal, Canada. He is one of the great thinkers of our time. His books, The Blank Slate, The Language Instinct, How the Mind Works, have all been New York Times bestseller books. They are the kinds of books that are written for both scientists and uh, everybody else. These are, there's, there's, not two, there's more than two genres of pop science and technical science. There is uh, this, this genre, the kind of books that Jared Diamond writes, for example. That is, there's not the popular version and the technical version. This is the only version there is. Galileo started that and, and Darwin continued the tradition. The origin of species is the only version there is. And I would use that analogy for this book, um, The Better Angels of Our Nature. Let me just be blunt. I always say nice things about our author's books because that's my job. Uh, but this one really is spectacular. This is one of the most important books I've ever read. It may be one of the most important science books, if not at least social science books ever written. Uh, and I, I'm serious about that. It's really a masterpiece of research and writing. I'm predicting it'll win the, the Pulitzer Prize this year. And I say that as an author who has a book out this year, too. It's, it's after you read mine, you should read now. <laughs> This really is a spectacular book. It, has, uh, it, it really does deserve the praise that, say, um, uh, the New York Times Review gave it, uh, and others as well. And uh, it, it's, uh, it is, it's broad, spectacular, dealing with science, social science, anthropology, history, and so on. With that, please help me welcome Dr. Steven Pinker. Thank you. <clears throat> Believe it or not, violence has been in decline for long stretches of time, and we may be living in the most peaceful era in our species' existence. The decline of violence has not been steady, it has not brought violence down to zero, and it is not guaranteed to continue. But I hope to persuade you that it is a persistent historical development, visible on the scale from millennia to years, from wars and genocides to the spanking of children and the treatment of animals. I'm going to walk you through six major historical declines of violence. In each case, present their immediate causes in terms of particular historical events of the era, and then try to tie them together in terms of their ultimate causes, namely general historical forces interacting with human nature. The first historical decline of violence I call the pacification process. Until 5,000 years ago, humans everywhere lived in anarchy without central government. What was life like in this state of nature? This is a question that thinkers have speculated about for centuries. Thomas Hobbes famously said that in a state of nature, the life of man is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. A century later, Jean-Jacques Rousseau countered that nothing can be more gentle than him in his primitive state. Now, these two men were talking through their hats. Neither of them had any idea what life was like in a state of nature. But today, we can do better, because there are two sources of evidence about rates of violence in non-state societies. The first is forensic archaeology, a kind of CSI paleolithic. <laughs> Namely, what proportion of prehistoric skeletons have signs of violent trauma, such as bashed in skulls, decapitations, arrowheads embedded in bones, or mummies found with ropes around their necks? <laughs> I found 20 estimates from prehistoric archaeological sites, and they span quite a range. The average is 15%. That is, 15% of prehistoric skeletons have signs of violent trauma. Let's just compare that figure to some from more uh, recent times and places. Europe and the US in the 20th century had a rate of death in war of about 2 thirds of 1%. The world as a whole in the 20th century, throwing in all the war deaths, all the indirect war deaths from uh, famine and uh, disease, throwing in all of the genocides and throwing in all the man-made famines brings you up to about 3%. The world in the year 2005 has a bar that is less than a pixel high. Uh, it corresponds to about 3 one hundredths of 1%. The second source of evidence is ethnographic vital statistics. 
There are a number of pockets of the world where the spread of government has not penetrated, and uh, until recently, people have lived without uh, government control. What ethnographers have tabulated rates of death from warfare as opposed to all other causes uh, in many of these hunter-gatherer and hunter-horticulturalist peoples. Here are 27 estimates I found, and again, they span quite a range, but the average is 524 per 100,000 per year. That is about one half of 1% of the population is killed in war every year. Let's compare that figure to some modern states, and this time I'm gonna stack the deck by picking some of the most war-torn states in recent memory, such as, say, Germany in the 20th century, two world wars, and the rate is about 150. Russia in the 20th century, two world wars and a civil war, about 140. Japan in the 20th century, uh, about 30, uh, with a uh, world war that included two nuclear explosions. United States in the 20th century, two world wars and at least half a dozen other foreign wars, less than uh, four per 100,000 per year. The entire world in the 20th century, throwing in all of the genocides, man-made famines, and war deaths of all kinds, gets you up to about uh, 60 per 100,000 per year. And the world in the year 2005, again, less than a pixel high, with a rate of about a third of a war death per 100,000 per year. So not to put too fine a point on it, but when it comes to life in a state of nature, Hobbes was right, Rousseau was wrong. <laughs> the immediate cause uh, was almost certainly the rise and expansion of states, the various Paxes that students of history learn about, the Pax Romana, Pax Islamica, Pax Hispanica, and so on, in which a, a state or empire uh, brought down violence within its territory, not out of any benevolent interest in the welfare of its citizens, but rather because tribal raiding and feuding is a nuisance to kings and emperors, because it simply settles scores among them or shuffles resources around at a dead loss to the king, who'd much rather keep uh, the uh, subjects alive to supply him with slaves and soldiers and uh, taxes. Just as a farmer has an incentive to prevent his livestock from killing each other, because it does, does the farmer no good, uh, so a king or emperor will try to tamp down on tribal and, raid, and uh, raiding and feuding within his territory. A couple of direct comparisons that make this point uh, include one that compares the percentage of skeletons with signs of violent trauma uh, in a, a large sample of pre-Columbian uh, skeletons, this, that is, all of them before the arrival of the Europeans in 1492, divided into those that lived in the early uh, civilizations of the Americas versus those that lived in as hunter-gatherers. The uh, hunter-gatherers had a uh, death rate of a, more than 13 percent. The skeletons from states had a death rate of less than 3 percent. Uh, turning to ethnographic vital statistics, the, the one direct comparison that I found compares uh, the Kung San of the Kalahari Desert before the imposition of state control by the Botswana government at a rate of more than 40 per 100,000 per year. Within a decade of state control, that fell to uh, less than 30. The second historical decline of violence can be illustrated by this woodcut showing a typical day of, in the life of uh, people in the Middle Ages. <laughs> uh, and uh, they, I call the decline the civilizing process for reasons that will soon become clear. Turns out that homicide records in many parts of Europe go back literally centuries, and historical criminologists have plotted them over time. This is a graph that stretches from 1,200 to 2,000. It plots the homicide rate on a logarithmic scale from uh, a tenth of a homicide per 100,000 per year to 1 to 10 to 100. And as you can see, there has been a massive decline over the last 800 years, so that a medieval Englishman had a 35 times greater chance of being murdered than his contemporary descendant. Uh, this is true not just in England, but in every European country for which these data have been gathered. Here we see Italy, Netherlands, Germany, and Switzerland, and Scandinavia, as well as England. Here is the average of those <coughs> five regions, which shows the 
uh, 30-fold or so decline from the Middle Ages to the present. And for comparison, I've also put that up that 524 per 100,000 figure for the non-state societies. Uh, this gap is what I call the pacification process. This decline is what I'm calling the civilizing process. I got the name from the classic book by Norbert Elias called The Civilizing Process, in which he argued that in the transition from Middle Ages to modernity, there was a cent consolidation of central states and kingdoms from the patchwork of principalities and uh, duchies and baronies that polka dotted Europe. With it, criminal justice was nationalized. The king started to, uh, or his, the representative of the crown, called a coroner, would investigate deaths so that the king could extract uh, penalties from the family of the perpetrator. Uh, as a result, a life uh, characterized by warlords, namely knights, and uh, constant feuding and brigandage along the highways was replaced by the king's justice. There was also, during this time, a growing infrastructure of commerce. Financial instruments like money and finance that could be recognized within the borders of these newly consolidated states, and technological improvements such as in transportation and timekeeping that all made uh, trade less expensive and more uh, inviting. As a result, zero-sum plunder began to give way to positive-sum trade, and that, all of this led to a psychological change in which the way to get ahead was to exercise self-control and empathy rather than cultivating fierceness and bellicosity. The third historical transition can be illustrated with some of the methods by which the early kingdoms kept peace within their kingdoms. Extreme punishments such as breaking on the wheel, burning at the stake, clawing, sawing in half, and impalement. But in a process that has been called the humanitarian revolution, these uh, forms of torture as a use of punishment were eliminated. Here is a timeline showing uh, 16 countries and the uh, date at which they abolished judicial torture. The abolitions were concentrated in the 18th century, including our own prohibition of cruel and unusual punishment in the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution. But this uh, 18th century was a special era in bringing about a large number of humanitarian reforms, such as the abolition of the death penalty for non-lethal crimes. In 18th century England, there were 222 capital offenses on the books, including poaching, counterfeiting, robbing a rabbit warren, being in the company of gypsies, and strong evidence of malice in a child seven to 14 years of age. <laughs> the uh, death penalty was not only on the books, but it was applied exuberantly. In uh, Samuel Johnson wrote of an eight-year-old girl who was hanged for stealing a petticoat. Uh, by 1861, these had been reduced to, to four. Likewise, in 17th and 18th century America, the death penalty was prescribed and used for theft, sodomy, bestiality, adultery, witchcraft, concealing birth, burglary, slave revolt, counterfeiting, and horse theft. Uh, in this graph shows the percentage of American executions for crimes other than murder from 1650 to 2000. You can see that in the colonial period, a majority of executions were for crimes other than murder. By the late 20th century, the only crime that has been punished uh, by death other than murder is conspiracy to commit murder. Of course, the death penalty itself has been targeted for elimination in every Western democracy except the United States. Uh, this graph shows that there was a wave of abolitions in the last 60 or so years uh, in European countries, but well before they struck capital punishment from the law books, they had lost their taste for applying it. Uh, the blue line shows the number of European countries that actually carry out execu executions, and that has been in steady decline since the 18th century. On average, 50 years passed between the formal abolition of capital punishment and the last execution that was carried out. Now, the United States is an outlier in this trend, or I should say that uh, 34 out of the 50 states are outliers in retaining capital punishment. But even then, the American death penalty is a shadow of its former self. This graph shows the number of American executions per capita 
uh, from colonial times to the present. And you can see that for all its notoriety, the death penalty is relatively infrequently applied in the United States, maybe 45 a year in a country that has almost 17,000 homicides per year. Also abolished during this era were witch hunts, religious persecution, such as burning heretics alive, dueling, blood sports, debtors' prisons, and most famously, slavery. This timeline for number of countries that abolished slavery shows that uh, a few hundred years ago, slavery was legal pretty much everywhere in the world. Beginning in the late 18th century, there was an inexorable process of abolition which culminated in 1980 with the abolition of legal slavery in the last country in the world, Mauritania. And so for the first time in history, slavery is illegal everywhere in the world. What were the immediate causes of the humanitarian revolution? Well, a plausible uh, uh, hypothesis is that uh, it was affluence. The, perhaps as uh, increasing technology and economic efficiency made people's lives longer and more pleasant, they put a higher value on their own lives and by extension a higher value on the lives of others. Unfortunately, uh, the timing doesn't work out. This graph shows the growth of per capita income in England from 1200 to 2000. And as you can see, wealth only began to increase with the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century, but most of the humanitarian reforms were concentrated in the uh, 18th century, when income had barely budged since the Middle Ages. I think a more plausible hypothesis in terms of the timeline is the uh, advent of printing and literacy. Economic historians tell us that book production was the only industry that showed an increase in productivity prior to the Industrial Revolution. Indeed, prior to the 18th century, there was a more than a 20-fold increase in the efficiency with which books were uh, printed and distributed. This efficiency was put into practice, and so in the 18th century, there was an exponential growth in the number of books published, and there were more people who could read them. In, it was in the 18th century that for the first time a majority of Englishmen were literate. Why should literacy matter? Well, this is an era that we also call the Enlightenment. There was a widespread debunking of superstition and ignorance. If a population becomes disabused of uh, malarkey, such as the beliefs that Jews poison wells, heretics go to hell, <coughs> witches cause crop failures, children are possessed by the devil, Africans are brutish, and so on, it's bound to undermine many rationales for violence. As Voltaire said in this era, those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. Also, uh, literacy is one of a number of technologies of cosmopolitanism, things that encourage ideas and people to mix. And it is plausible that as people start to consume more fiction and history and journalism, they start to see the world from vantage points other than their own. They start to inhabit other people's minds, and perhaps that uh, expands their empathy and lessens their cruelty. If you get into the habit of imagining what life is like from another person's point of view, maybe you'll take less pleasure in seeing them sawn in half. <laughs> the fourth major decline in violence has been called the long peace. And it speaks to the widespread belief that the 20th century was the most violent in history. The problem with that claim is that no one who makes it ever cites numbers from any century other than the 20th. And it is quite likely that that claim is false. Just take uh, as a contrast the supposedly peaceful 19th century. Well, it is true that the 19th century saw two intervals in Europe that were relatively free of major war. But if you take the century as a whole, and if you take the world as a whole, you find that it contains a number of bloodbaths, such as the Napoleonic Wars with four million deaths, the Taiping Rebellion in China, the most destructive civil war in history with 20 million deaths. The most destructive war in American history was the Civil War with 650,000. The conquests of Shaka Zulu in Southern Africa killed between one and two million people. Uh, I don't want to leave any continent out, so here's one from South America. Uh, the War of the Triple Alliance is sometimes considered proportionally the most lethal war, interstate war in history. It killed perhaps 60% of the population of Paraguay. 
Uh, then there were African slave raiding wars and imperial wars in Africa, Asia, and the South Pacific, whose death tolls we can't even begin to estimate. Now, it is true that the Second World War was the deadliest in terms of the absolute number of people killed. But it's not so clear that it was the most destructive in terms of the percentage of the world's population. That is, if you were a person living in these various eras, what, are the, what is the probability that you would be a victim of, of, uh, of uh, violence through war? Here I've taken the 100 worst things that people have ever done to each other that we know of, uh, which I've taken from a man who calls himself an atrocitologist. Uh, <laughs> Matthew White, and I've taken his list and just scaled the numbers by the population of the world at the time. From 500 BC to 2000 CE, again plotted on a logarithmic scale. Here you can see that scaled for population, World War II uh, only comes in at ninth place, and World War I doesn't even make the top 10. And in fact, history's worst atrocities were pretty much evenly sprinkled through 2,500 years of uh, world history. Now, you'll notice that there is a funneling downward uh, for the last 500 years. Presumably, this is not because in ancient times they only committed big, huge, whopping atrocities. And more recently, we've committed both big ones, medium ones, sized ones, and small ones. A more obvious explanation is that historical records are more complete in the last 500 years. Uh, and that the earlier, smaller atrocities have long been forgotten uh, to history. If we concentrate on this period with better records, the last 500 years, then we can follow the trajectory of war more closely. Jack Levy has plotted trends in great power war over the last half millennium. Uh, great powers are the 800-pound gorillas of the day, the nations that can project military force beyond their own borders. Levy's first graph shows the percentage of years that the great powers fought each other in 25-year intervals, and uh, from 1500 to 2000. And as you can see, several hundred years ago, the great powers were pretty much always at war with each other. That's what great powers did. Uh, more recently, they are seldom at war with each other. Here we have a graph showing the duration of wars involving a great power, which has also shown a decline. History used to have things like the, the 30 Years' War, the 80 Years' War, the 100 Years' War. In the 20th century, we had the Six-Day War. <laughs> this graph shows the frequency of wars involving a great power. How often did a great power uh, start a new war? And that, too, has shown a, an overall decrease over 500 years. This graph, however, shows a trend that has gone in the opposite direction. Namely, once a war has begun, how many people does it kill per country per year? And here we see the effects of increased, uh, increasingly deadly weaponry and increasingly effective military organization. So in fact, wars became more and more deadly over the centuries until 1950, in which they suddenly became less deadly. Again, this is a logarithmic scale. And so we've been living through a period in which wars have become both less frequent and less deadly. If you combine them and you simply add up all of the deaths in great power wars, again plotted on a logarithmic scale, you can see a rather bumpy trajectory, one, however, that leaves us in the last 25 years with the lowest rate of death in, uh, from great power war in 500 years of history. Let's now zoom in on those last four data points and look at the trajectory of war in the 20th century and the first decade of the 21st. This graph shows that the uh, that last spasm of deadly wars uh, occurred with the Second World War and a prior one in the First World War, but that since then, the rate has come uh, bumpily downward, and uh, we are living in a period of, uh, by historical standards, uh, astonishingly low rate of death in warfare. The long piece refers to the fact that since 1946, Interstate war, that is wars with one country on each side, have uh, plummeted. There were no wars between the biggest of the great powers, the US and the USSR, contrary to all expert predictions. No nuclear weapon has been used since Nagasaki, again, confounding every expert prediction that nuclear war was inevitable. There have been no wars between the great powers since the end of the Korean War in 1953. 
no wars between Western European countries. And I think I have to uh, explain for younger people that this is a big deal. You might think to yourself, well, of course there are no wars in Western Europe. No one would expect, say, you know, France and Germany to fight a war. <laughs> But that's a historically unusual state of affairs. Uh, and before 1945, Western European countries started two new wars a year for 600 years. And there have been no wars between developed countries, the 44 richest countries in the world. Again, this is uh, more surprising than it looks. Today, we naturally expect that wars are things that take place in, in poor backward parts of the world. But for most of history, it was the rich developed nations that kept getting involved in, in wars with each other. And when you get two rich countries fighting each other, they can do a lot of damage. Well, what about the rest of the world? I've talked about Europe. I've talked about great powers. I've talked about uh, rich countries. What about uh, everywhere else? Uh, this is the fifth major historical decline of violence, a more recent one. Now, since 1946, there, as I mentioned, there are fewer interstate wars. There ha have, however, been more civil wars as newly independent states with inept governments fought off insurgent movements, both sides armed, financed, and egged on by the Cold War superpowers. But as you'll see, after 1991, with the end of the Cold War, even the number of civil wars went into, into decline. And I'm going to show that to you now on a graph. This graph extends from 1946 to 2009, and it's a stacked layer graph in which the thickness of each lever, level corresponds to the number of ongoing wars, where for this graph, a war is an armed conflict that kills as few as 25 people in a year. Uh, here we have the trajectory of colonial wars, which no longer exist because the European empires gave up their, co their uh, <coughs> colonies. Here we have the number of interstate wars, which as you can see has been petering out. However, here we have the number of civil and civil wars, both the pure civil wars that are only fought within the borders of a country and the internationalized civil wars in which some foreign power butts in to uh, help the government fight off insurgents, <clears throat> but uh, which showed a huge increase in starting in the 1960s, although that trend has recently gone into decline as well. The crucial question, though, is which wars kill more people? The large number of small civil wars of recent decades or the small number of large interstate wars of the decades before? This graph shows that uh, first we have here the interstate wars. And as you can see, the number of people killed per war per year from uh, the 1950s to the 2000s has plunged. Here we have the corresponding figures for internationalized civil wars and for internal civil wars. And you can see that the uh, civil wars of recent decades have been far less deadly than the interstate wars of earlier decades. If you now aggregate all of the deaths from all of the wars, uh, you get a, uh, the, the following result. Again, this goes from 1946 to 2006. Here are the deaths from colonial wars, which have tapered off to zero. Here we have the deaths from interstate wars, which have fallen bumpily downward. We have a spike here that includes the Korean War, a spike that includes the Vietnam War, and a um, hill that includes the Iran-Iraq War, and they have petered out to almost nothing. Here we have the civil wars and the internationalized civil wars which, as you can see, have uh, not in the least made up for the decline of deaths from interstate war in earlier decades. Here we are in the first decade of the 21st century with globally unprecedentedly low rates of death in warfare. So the dream of the 1960s folk singers is starting to come true. The world has almost put an end to war. Well, what about genocide? It's often said that more people died in the 20th century from genocides than from uh, wars. And the 20th century, indeed, is often called the age of genocide. However, every historian who has looked at the history of genocide disagrees with this claim. I'm going to read to you from page one of one of these histories by Frank Chalk and Kurt Jonasson in their History of Genocide which they begin their book by saying, genocide has been practiced in all regions of the world and during all periods in history. 
We know that in ancient times, empires have disappeared and that cities were destroyed, but we do not know what happened to the bulk of the populations involved in these events. Their fate was simply too unimportant. When they were mentioned at all, they were usually lumped together with the herds of oxen, sheep, and other livestock. Looking at the available evidence from antiquity, one might develop a hypothesis that most wars at that time were genocidal in character. What do they have, in, uh, uh, or just to elaborate, it's um, their claim and th that of every other uh, historian of genocide that I have consulted is that the age, so-called age of genocide is really the age in which people started to care about genocide. Uh, indeed, the word itself only appeared in 1944. What are some examples of pre-20th century genocides? Well, many people believe that uh, the, in, in the events narrated in the Bible, and they have to come to term with the facts, ter terms with the fact that almost every uh, few pages there was a, another genocide ordered by God, by the way. So the Amalekites, Amorites, Canaanites, Hivites, Hittites, Jebusites, and so on were all put to the edge of the sword, every last man, woman, and child. Uh, even if you don't believe that these stories record actual historical events, and I don't, uh, they clearly record a practice of the time and also an attitude that persisted for millennia. Namely, there's nothing particularly wrong with genocide as long as it doesn't happen to you. <laughs> the uh, Athenians in Melos, the Romans in Carthage, the Mongol invasions, the Crusades, the European wars of religion, and the colonization of Americas, the Americas, Africa, and Australia all involved numerous genocides. Only for the 20th century do we have anything uh, approximating a time series. And it speaks to the question of whether the genocides in Bosnia and Rwanda mean that nothing has changed, that the world never learned the lessons of the Holocaust. Well, here we have a couple of graphs showing the rate of death from genocide in the 20th century. And there certainly was a horrific period of bloodletting concentrated in the 1940s. But since then, the trajectory has gone bumpily downward. And in fact, a minute fraction of the number of people uh, who were killed in the genocides of decades past are victims of genocide. Today, we're living in a period of unusually low rate of death from genocides of all kinds. What were the causes of these developments, the long piece and the new piece? A number of them were hypothesized several hundred years ago by Immanuel Kant in his essay, Perpetual Peace, in which he proposed that democracy, trade, and an international community all lessened the risk of death in warfare. More recently, Bruce Russett and John O'Neill have uh, statistically um, corroborated Kant's prediction by showing that all three of these factors have increased in the second half of the 20th century, and more importantly, all of them are statistical predictors of peace. Here we have the number of democracies, which has uh, increased, especially at the end of the Cold War. The number of autocracies has now decreased, and there are far more democracies in the world than autocracies for the first time in history. This graph shows that international trade skyrocketed after the end of World War II. This graph shows uh, that membership in inter intergovernmental organizations has increased since the end of the 19th century with a, an acceleration after World War II. And this graph shows another kind of um, international community, namely the closest thing we have to an international police force, uh, United Nations and other peacekeepers. The green line shows the number of peacekeeping operations, which has increased, particularly after the end of the Cold War. But more importantly, these peacekeeping operations have been manned by uh, much larger numbers of soldiers who get themselves in between opposing forces. And a number of studies have shown that though peacekeeping doesn't always work, it works far more often than when the two sides are left to fight it out to the bitter end. Well, the final historical decline of violence can be called the rights revolutions. The targeting of violence at smaller scales directed against vulnerable uh, sectors of the population, such as racial minorities, women, children, homosexuals, and animals. The civil rights movement put an end to the practice of lynching in the United States, which used to take place in the late 19th century at a rate of about 150 a year. By the 1950s, that had gone down to zero. 
More recently, the FBI has tracked hate crime murders of blacks since the mid-1990s. They were never very plentiful, about five per year when they were first recorded. Even that has gone down to one in a country with 17,000 homicides. Non-lethal hate crimes against blacks, such as intimidation and assault, have been in decline. And the racist attitudes that encourage violence against minorities have been in decline. This graph shows the result of uh, opinion polls that ask white Americans from 1940 to 2000 whether they agree that black and white students should go to separate schools and whether they would move out if a black family moved in next door. Both of those attitudes have fallen into the single digits, basically the range of crank opinion. Uh, <clears throat> It's a worldwide phenomenon. This graph shows the number of countries that have various uh, discriminatory laws, Jim Crow and apartheid laws, and they have been in steady decline. The blue line shows the number of countries that have bent over backwards to ameliorate the effects of past discrimination with remedial discrimination and affirmative action policies. And now more countries have affirmative action policies than have discriminatory policies. The women's rights movement has helped to bring down the rate of rape by 80% since the early 1970s. It has brought down the rate of domestic violence uh, against women, and uh, also the domestic violence against men has decreased, although by not uh, as much. And it has reduced the ultimate form of domestic violence or spousal abuse, namely uxoricide, the killing of wives, and mariticide, the killing of husbands, both have gone down, mariticide much more dramatically. The women's rights movement has been very, very good for husbands. <laughs> the children's rights movement has seen a decrease in the number of American states with paddling and other forms of corporal punishment from 1955 to the present. In every public opinion poll in the West, approval of spanking has gone down. Child abuse has gone down since statistics were first recorded in the 90s, both physical abuse and sexual abuse. And violence in schools has come down since statistics were first kept in the early 1990s. The gay rights movement has seen an increase in the num number of states that have decriminalized homosexuality, both nation states worldwide and American states. It's now 100% following a Supreme Court ruling. Every Opinion poll has shown a decline in anti-gay attitudes, such as whether homosexuality is morally wrong, should be made illegal, or whether gay people should be denied equal opportunity. And hate crime intimidations of gay people have gone down since they were first measured. The animal rights movement has seen a decrease in hunting, an increase in vegetarianism, both in the UK and the US, and a sharp decrease in the number of motion pictures in which animals were harmed. <laughs> well, now the question is, why has violence declined on so many scales of time and magnitude? One possibility is that human nature itself has changed, and our taste for violence has somehow been bred out of us, a possibility that I consider to be unlikely. Uh, for one thing, uh, toddlers con continue to kick, bite, and hit. Uh, little boys continue to play fight in all cultures. Uh, when little boys and indeed little girls grow up, they take enormous pleasure in vicarious violence, such as murder mysteries, Greek tragedies, Shakespearean dramas, video games, hockey, <laughs> and movies starring a certain uh, ex-governor of this very state. <laughs> And um, informative data come from surveys of homicidal fantasies. Uh, have you ever fantasized about killing someone you don't like? Someone, for example, who has humiliated you in public uh, or who is a romantic rival? Well, the result of, of uh, surveys of college students show that about 15% of women and a third of men frequently fantasize about killing people they don't like. <laughs> and more than 60% of women and three quarters of men at least occasionally fantasize about killing people they don't like. And the rest of them are lying. <laughs> A more likely possibility is that human nature is extraordinarily complex 
and has always comprised inclinations toward violence, as we see in the homicidal fantasies, uh, but also inclinations that counteract them, what Abraham Lincoln called the better angels of our nature. And that historical circumstances have increasingly favored our peaceable inclinations. Among our motives for violence, there is just raw, naked exploitation, the elimination of a person that happens to be uh, standing in the way of something that you want, as in rape, plunder, conquest, and the elimination of rivals. There's the uh, very different urge for dominance, the desire to climb the pecking order and become alpha male, or a corresponding desire for one's group to be supreme other gr uh, over other groups, one's race, one's religion, one's nation, one's ethnic group. Yet another category consists of moralistic violence, basically revenge in which you inflict a harm in uh, response to a harm in a way that is not only permissible but considered mandatory, resulting in vendettas, rough justice, and cruel punishments. And then there are ideologies where a belief system that takes root in a society can justify vast outlays of violence, such as militant religions, nationalism, fascism, Nazism, and communism, which justify violence by a utopian cost-benefit analysis. Namely, if your belief system holds out the prospect of a world that will be infinitely good forever, well, then you could commit as much violence as you want in pursuit of the utopia, and you're still going to be uh, ahead of the game. You will have done more good than harm. Uh, also, imagine that there are people who hear about your scheme for an infinitely perfect world and nonetheless oppose it. How evil are they? Well, you do the math. Uh, they are arbitrarily evil and hence deserve arbitrarily severe punishment, which is why some of the uh, most brutal events in human history have been inspired by the altruistic pursuit of a perfect world. Well, what do we have on the other side to counteract these inner demons? We have self-control, the ability to anticipate the consequences of behavior and inhibit violent impulses. Empathy, the ability to feel others' pain. A moral sense, which includes some intuitions that actually can increase violence, such as tribalism, authority, and puritanism but also some intuitions such as fairness that can counteract violence. And we have reason, the cognitive processes that allow us to engage in objective, detached analysis. The crucial question then is, which historical developments bring out our better angels and stay our hands before they can commit acts of violence? One possibility is that Hobbes got it right when he justified the Leviathan a state and a judicial system with a monopoly on the legitimate use of violence. Uh, the idea is that a disinterested third party can eliminate the incentives for exploitative attack by punishing aggression and canceling out the anticipated gain. That in turn reduces the need for everyone else to maintain a uh, belligerent stance in order to uh, deter and avenge harms done against them. It can circumvent the self-serving biases by which all sides exaggerate the malevolence of their adversaries and exaggerate their own innocence, stoking blood feuds and, and cycles of uh, revenge. Uh, what is, the, is there any historical evidence for the pacifying effect of a Leviathan? Well, I've already mentioned earlier in the talk the pacifying and civilizing effects of the expansion of states. One can watch this movie run backwards in zones in which government retreats uh, and leaves zones of anarchy, such as the American Wild West, where the cliche of the old cowboy movies was that the nearest sheriff is 200 miles away, so you have to defend yourself uh, with your gun. In failed states, collapsed empires, and in mafias and street gangs that deal in contraband and so can't avail themselves of the dispute resolution uh, powers of the state and have to protect their own interests with the threat and application of violence. And on the international stage, the statistical effectiveness of international peacekeepers shows the, uh, how an international leviathan can bring down uh, the, the rate of uh, in international violence. A second possibility is the theory of gentle commerce, according to which plunder is a zero-sum game. One, the victors 
loss. Gain is the vanquished's loss. But trade is a positive sum game, one in which everyone can win. And as improving technology allows the trade of, peoples, of goods and ideas over longer distances among larger groups of people and at lower cost, uh, more and more of the rest of the world becomes more valuable alive than dead. Uh, much has been written about the rivalry between the United States and China over uh, economic supremacy. Nonetheless, I think it's unlikely that this rivalry will result in a shooting war. Uh, among other things, uh, we wouldn't go to war with them because they make too much of our stuff, and uh, they wouldn't go to war with us because we owe them too much money. <laughs> Some historical evidence comes from regression analyses, statistical surveys across large numbers of countries that show that countries with open economies and greater reliance on international trade get embroiled in fewer wars, uh, host fewer civil wars, and host fewer genocides. A third possibility has been called the expanding circle, a term that was coined by Peter Singer, but the idea goes back to Charles Darwin, namely that evolution bequeathed us with a sense of empathy, an ability to feel others' pain. Unfortunately, by default, we apply it only to a narrow circle of friends and families and cute, warm, fuzzy things. <laughs> but over the course of history, one can see the circle of empathy expanding to embrace the, uh, not just the village, but the clan, the tribe, the nation, other races, both sexes, children, and most recently, other species. This just begs the question of what expanded the circle, and the technologies of cosmopolitanism that I mentioned earlier are a plausible candidate. As people consume more history, literature, and media, and journalism, as they have more opportunities to travel and rub shoulders with other people, uh, they may become more empathic to them. And we know from laboratory studies that if you get people to read the words of someone else and adopt their perspective, whether the person is real or fictitious, they tend to become more sympathetic to that individual and also toward the category that that individual represents. Some historical evidence includes the fact that the humanitarian revolution of the 17th and 18th century was preceded by the Age of Reason and the Enlightenment. The uh, 20th century, the second half, uh, which had the long peace and the rights revolutions occurred in the global village, the uh, saturation of the globe by electronic media, and that the one can speculate, it's a little too soon to tell, but that the future historians might say that if the color revolutions in Arab Spring uh, end up successful, they uh, quite certainly were fostered by the internet and social media. Finally, there's the escalator of reason, the possibility that the growth of literacy, education, and public discourse encouraged people to think more abstractly and universally. That, in turn, encourages them to rise above their parochial vantage point, makes it harder to privilege their own interests over others. It replaces a morality based on tribalism, authority, and puritanism with a morality based on fairness and universal rules. It allows people to recognize the futility of cycles of violence and increasingly see violence as a problem to be solved rather than as a contest to be won. Some historical evidence includes the little known fact that abstract reasoning abilities as measured by IQ tests increased steadily over the course of the 20th century. The so-called Flynn effect in which IQ scores increased three IQ points per decade throughout the 20th century. Other studies have shown that individual people and aggregate societies with higher levels of education and measured intelligence <laughs> commit fewer violent crimes, cooperate more in experimental games, have more classically liberal attitudes, such as opposition to racism and sexism, and are more receptive to democracy 10 years down the line. The final question that I'll consider is why all of these forces have been pushing in the same direction. And I think the, the best way of thinking about it is that violence is what game theorists call a social dilemma. Namely, it is always tempting to an aggressor to exploit a victim, but it is ruinous to the victim. Since anyone can be both either an aggressor or a victim, in the long run, everyone is better off if violence is avoided. The problem, the human dilemma, is not how to 
abjure violence, because if you do, you're, you, you will be a sitting duck to an aggressor. It's rather how to get the other guy to agree to refrain from violence at the same time as you do. One can imagine that over the course of history, human experience and human ingenuity have been gradually chipping away at this problem, just like we've been gradually solving the problem posed by other scourges of nature, like pestilence and hunger. And indeed, the four forces that I have mentioned have all increased the material, emotional, and cognitive incentives of all parties to avoid violence at the same time. Well, I think that whatever the explanation is for the decline of violence, its implications are profound. For one thing, it calls for a reorientation of our efforts towards violence reduction from a moralistic mindset to an empirical mindset. That is, instead of asking, why is there war, perhaps we'd be better off asking, why is there peace? Instead of, what are we doing wrong, perhaps we should ask, what have we been doing right? Because we have been doing something right, and it sure would be good to figure out what it is. Also, I think that the decline of violence calls for a reassessment of modernity, of the centuries-long move that has eroded family, tribe, tradition, and religion in favor of individualism, cosmopolitanism, reason, and science. Now, everyone acknowledges that modernity has brought us some good things, like longer and healthier lives, less ignorance and superstition, and richer experiences, but there have also been currents of romanticism and nostalgia that have questioned the price. Is it worth it if we have to live with terrorism and genocide and world wars and nuclear weapons? However, if despite impressions, the long-term trend, though halting and incomplete, is that violence of all kinds is decreasing, I think this calls for a rehabilitation of the concept of modernity and progress. And is a cause for gratitude for the institutions of civilization and enlightenment that have made it possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Eight hundred pages in fifty minutes. How was that? <laughs> That's impressive. There's a few more details in the book. So we do have Q and A for a few minutes. Uh, there's two microphones here and here. You can line up and we'll alternate back and forth. The book signing will be on the stage here. We'll bring the table out. You can line up here to get your book signed. You purchase a book, get your book signed here. You can pick up Skeptic Magazine and all the other stuff outside. So let's go ahead. Actually, I'll take the host's privilege of asking the first question okay. of. Uh, believers and Christians in particular argue in our various debates it was religion and Christendom and the spread of biblical values that has caused all these things. How do you respond to that? <laughs> yes. Well, um, I don't think that religion has been responsible for, um, for all of the uh, atrocities that have taken place over the last millennium, but uh, it, they sure do deserve blame for uh, a bunch of them. Uh, they, <laughs> The Crusades with, uh, killed a million people in a population that's one-sixth the size of the world today. You multiply by six, you get that very disturbing figure of six million uh, Jews and Muslims killed uh, in the Crusades. You've got the European Wars of Religion, uh, like the Thirty Years' War, the Eighty Years' War. The Taiping Rebellion in China was uh, religious in inspiration. Nowadays, uh, many of the biggest remaining threats are posed by uh, militant Islam. Uh, so, uh, so no, um, there, it is not true that, uh, that if you discard religion, that makes you humane, because there have also been irreligious uh, movements that have ideologies that have, been, that have uh, perpetrated genocides and, and atrocities, such as uh, Marxism. But religion is not the, um, the antidote to murderous ideologies. And there are a number of reasons uh, why in many of these cases, though not all, uh, the advances have been done in the teeth of fierce opposition from religious authorities. When uh, Cesare Beccaria wrote the first um, treatise against judicial torture and for the moderation of criminal punishments, which resulted in our, in our Eighth Amendment prohibition of cruel and unusual punishment, uh, a, a highly influential book <clears throat> translated into 17 languages, influenced legislatures all over Europe to eliminate breaking on the wheel and so on. It was placed on the papal index of uh, forbidden books. Uh, 
There have been uh, some uh, religiously inspired movements that have um, uh, done some good in African American inner cities. It's often been church leaders that have worked with community organizers and the police to bring down rates of violent crime. The American West, the, uh, it was often the Protestant churches that tried to civilize the wild young cowboys. Um, and there have been various rhetorical contributions, but by and large, I think it's been the forces of uh, humanism, starting in the Enlightenment, that have both brought violence down and have reformed religions, so that religions have become more um, humanistic, less militant, because they too have been affected by the same Enlightenment currents that have brought down violence in other spheres. Yes. Thank you so much for speaking today. Um, you listed your four uh, directions or put forces towards reducing violence, and I'm thinking of one that I think fits either in your third or your fourth, and that is empathy, but not the empathy that you describe, but towards oneself. Um, and I've just noticed in my own life that the more empathic I am towards myself, the more empathic I am towards others. And I was just wondering if you had any data about psychology or about uh, self-introspection and how that related to um, reduced violence. Yeah, it's... Um uh, it, it's an interesting suggestion. There's one version of that. I don't, know, I don't think it's the one that you have in mind, but when it, when, uh, instead of talking about empathy, if you talk about self-esteem, that it had a wave of popularity as a potential reducer of violence. California notoriously had a governor's uh, council to promote self-esteem, but it turns out that at least that version of the theory is spectacularly wrong, that it's actually <laughs> the people with high self-esteem who commit lots of violence, uh, your, 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 your rapist, your serial killer, uh, your neighborhood bully, uh, your um, uh, neighborhood goon all have self-esteem off the scale. And there's actually a reason for that. Uh, they are narcissistic, so the self -es this is self-esteem that is unearned and maintained by a belligerent attitude that if your claim to esteem is then challenged, you consider that to be a, an intolerable insult. Uh, and that insolent signal uh, from reality has to be punished in order to keep your self-esteem that high because it's unearned. And so it's the most violent people who tend to have the highest self-esteem. This is Roy Baumeister who did a lot of the research upending the conventional wisdom about self-esteem. You touch on my question, but just slightly, and I want to push it a little bit. Um, your analysis of violence is riveting. It's spectacular. But I'm curious about the significance of global poverty for your thesis. Um, if we take the work of Singer, and for that matter, Thomas Poga, seriously, um, more people died in the 20th century from global poverty, completely preventable disease and famine and so forth, than all of the genocides and wars combined. And so while I don't want to be sawn in half or burned at the stake, um, dying of preventable disease and starvation seems like a problem too. So I'm curious um, what you take the significance of those phenomena to be. Um, my understanding is they haven't dropped at least given certain time parameters, and it connects with empathy and all sorts of things that you talk about. Yeah, Thanks. a couple of things. Actually, they have been, uh, uh, deaths from poverty have been decreasing, that by um, global measures over the, the uh, last several decades, and indeed, probably on average through the 20th century, uh, longevity has increased worldwide, um, infant mortality has decreased, uh, death from disease has decreased, uh, other measures of human well-being, such as education, uh, female education, as well as death and war, have, all of them have shown improvement. Now, uneven, but uh, improvement that's been felt in every continent and that globally uh, has shown an increase. So it's not as if violence has gone uh, down and every other form of human preventable death has gone up. Quite the contrary. I think the progress has been um, across the board. We also make a moral difference, and perhaps one should argue that we shouldn't, between uh, deaths by uh, commission and deaths by omission. If I buy myself uh, some luxury, a, a nice necktie, and if I had spent the same amount of money sending it to Oxfam, I could have prevented a death, most people would consider that less heinous than if I pulled out a gun and I shot someone. Now, one could say a life is a life. What difference does it make? And there is a philosophical case to be made that there's no legitimate moral difference between those two, but uh, I tend to think there is, and most people tend to think there is. So uh, there is something about poverty that is, if not 
uh, unpreventable, it's a little harder to prevent than, say, um, dropping an atom bomb or, or even a uh, conventional bomb. Yes. Uh, so I, I'm, I know that you are um, arguing for an array of, of reasons and, and looking at more longer time scales for all of these trends. And I'm, but I'm also curious, in terms of short term, um, are there convincing observations in terms of the um, effects of like the state of the economy and, and all of these things? And, and uh, you know, with with our recent fluctuations and uh, how how that affects this sort yeah. of. Uh, Violence. Well, within the United States, it's actually gone in the opposite direction that one might predict, namely that as the economy has gone south in the last three years, the homicide rate has fallen three years in a row. So um, certainly, at least within this country, there, um, uh, it's not the case that when unemployment goes up, violent crime goes up as well. Uh, there's very little correlation. Uh, across the world, there's some evidence suggesting a slight increase in global homicide in the last three years, but it's, three years is a very difficult period and, uh, to, with which to spot any, any trends. More generally, there's um, a strong correlation between civil war and the extreme levels of poverty at the very bottom of the scale. So if you plot likelihood of civil war against GDP per capita, uh, it, um, it uh, plummets with the first uh, moves towards affluence in a country. That is, the countries at the very bottom of the scale have an outsized risk of civil war. Although it's not completely clear whether that shows that poverty causes war or that war causes poverty. Because every time you have a civil war and all of the, you know, the, the business managers are shot and the granaries are set on fire and the, 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 the railroad lines torn up, torn up and so on, that can mire you in po poverty for a long time to come. But there is certainly that connection at that end of the scale. Thanks. I'm really enjoying your book. I'd love to hear what you, have, what you think about the super Freakonomics theory that television had something to do with the rise of crime in the 60s and the Freakonomics theory about abortion having something to do with the fall of crime in the 90s. Yeah. The, the theory that um, Roe v. Wade led 20 years later to a decline in homicide I think is not uh, believed by anyone other than, than uh, Steve Levitt. Um, <laughs> and he, although he, and he himself, now lists abortion as only one of four causes of the 1990s crime decline. But, uh, but there, for a number of reasons, it, it seems unlikely. Among them, that it's the uh, who, upon getting pregnant, has an abortion. Is it the uh, most disorganized, impulsive, uh, and and uh, crime people in the most crime prone areas, or does it tend to be the middle class girls whose parents whose parents rush them to the abortion clinic? The uh, abortion, uh, the rate of uh, illegitimate children in poor sect and crime prone sections of societies actually went way up after Roe v. Wade rather than down. Uh, also, the first cohort of kids that were born in the post Roe v. Wade generation were not less violent. Uh, as they reached their crime prone years, they were more violent. So there are a number of, of statistical pro uh, problems with that analysis. In terms of television, uh, I don't know of the good quantitative uh, cause and effect uh, statistical analyses. Uh, but I suspect it, it may have played a role. I'm not sure. I haven't read Super Freakonomics, so I don't know what the causal hypothesis it, is. They, they just noticed a correlation. They noticed that the crime tended to rise in cities shortly after, in American cities, shortly after television came to those cities. Yeah. Well, here's a, a speculation, and I don't know whether that I offer in the book, and I don't know whether it's uh, it really has some support or not. But in the '60s, crime shot up, and it is not predicted by any of the standard sociological variables. It's not predicted by demography. It's not predicted by inequality. It's not predicted by affluence. So it's something of a puzzle. Uh, one possibility is that it wasn't. It is true that there was a bulge because of the baby boom of the crime-prone age cohort, 15 to 30. The problem is that the increase in crime based on the um, youth bulge should have been a 15% greater rate of crime, and instead it was 150% greater rate of crime. So here's a possible way that television could have multiplied uh, that uh, increment that we would have expected. Namely, every generation uh, has the problem of civilizing its young men. Uh, young men are a, a menace, and uh, 
they, they commit a disproportionate amount of violence of all kinds. And the question is, how do you get them to be law-abiding citizens? It's not implausible that if you turn on the TV and you see uh, thousands of people just like you uh, kind of defying convention and authority, exerting their dominance, showing that they're not going to be cowed by the establishment, by the older generation, then that could result in a uh, loosening of inhibitions, including inhibitions against violence that could have sent the rate up much higher than you'd expect from the numbers alone. So television could have been a, a multiplier, plausibly, although I don't know if, if that's true statistically. Thank you. Yeah. I was hoping you could comment on symbolic violence as opposed to physical violence, and whether or not you think that symbolic violence has increased or decreased. And by symbolic violence in the present era, I'm thinking more about stratification and unequal access to resources. Yeah. Uh, I, no, I don't. Uh, well, as I mentioned, human well-being has certainly increased, not decreased, as violence has decreased. But I, I think it's actually misleading to call it uh, symbolic violence. That it's a, that's really a, a, a moralistic rather than an analytic way of putting it. It's a way of saying that I'm opposed to unequal access to resources, so I will use a label that everyone agrees refers to something bad, apply it to this to try to export some of the indignation against violence and mobilize it in favor of um, reducing inequality. I don't think it's analytically helpful for the same reason that I don't think, say, a cancer researcher should worry about symbolic forms of cancer or metaphorical forms of cancer. <laughs> you could do it, but it just doesn't clarify the, the cause and effect relations. I think it's a really different problem. And I think it's misleading to lump together everything that one might deplore and consider them all manifestations of deplorable things. So I think violence should be analyzed separately. Uh, I've, uh, one of the things that's kind of uh, appalling is to see the increase in uh, at least violent rhetoric that seems to come, that seems to have increased lately. And I just wonder if when uh, violence prone people and organizations are on their way down, is there a dangerous up spike just before they collapse, or is it mainly just rhetorical? Yeah, I mean, first one would have to, I, I don't know if anyone has done this, but I, I, before speculating on that phenomenon, I want someone to document it by doing, say, a content analysis of political speeches over the decades, just to confirm that there really has been an increase in uh, rhetorical violence. Uh, I'm not sure that there has been, maybe there has been. But it's certainly, I think, uh, interesting that the two loudest, noisiest protest movements of the last five years, the Tea Party and Occupy Wall Street, have been 100% nonviolent. And we know in the past that a lot of uh, protest, economic and social protest, has quickly become violent. Uh, the town folk used to come out with the pitchforks and torches, and uh, in the 1960s, cities were burned down uh, and, and neighborhoods. There were regular race riots. There was union violence by unions and against unions. So um, again, not claiming, not wanting to claim necessarily this has gone down. It could have gone down, and I, I would want to wait to see the numbers. It's an interesting question. Um, the graphs you showed uh, for murder rates yeah. um, indicated a long-term decline. And we've also seen a decline in the last uh, several decades. But it looked on those graphs like there was an an increase in, uh, in the 20th century. Could you comment on that? Yes, there was, there was definitely an increase starting in the 1960s in uh, almost every Western nation. And this was the, uh, the graphs all had a little bit of a little ski jump at the end. That, those graphs ended in 2000. And since then, in uh, most countries, that little uh, increase has partly, though not completely, been reversed. And that's what the Freakonomics theory aimed to uh, explain. Yeah, and, and the um, observation that was attributed to super free economics that television uh, may have increased violence refers to that epoch in human history. That is the increase in uh, violent crime starting around 1962 uh, that remained high in the 70s and 80s before partly coming back down to earth in the early 90s. And again, there, the honest answer is that no one really knows why violence increased so much in the 1960s given that the ordinary sociological factors don't predict it. And that's why even quantitative criminologists tend to say there must be something in the culture that contributed to it. And I think the empowering of 
uh, young people against uh, authority and convention, uh, namely the 1960s, uh, explains the 1960s. <laughs> yeah. um, hello. You said that um, with your theory of violence declining, you stated that even though violence is at an all-time low now, that doesn't mean that in the future it will for sure that this trend will continue. But I was wondering if you think that there's anything we can do as a society to make sure that this trend does continue, aside yeah. from the obviousness of an individual not committing violence. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> yeah, which is, yeah, it's a good start, right, but yes. Um, certainly, <coughs> certainly the various um, cultural, social, and legal changes that tolerate less and less violence uh, I think have been effective. So the, the movement to consider rape to be an abomination, to work with the police and the court system to take rape more seriously, I think has to have explained that 80% decline in rape. Likewise, as child abuse was socially stigmatized, uh, you know, the, the Oprah Winfrey empire made it clear that child abuse was the cause of all kinds of problems, and social service agencies then picked up the cause and started to remove children from abusive homes or in prison, particularly abusive parents. More recently, we've seen that for bullying, where an entirely new category of violence kind of materialized, whereas in, in the past, bullying was you know, part of childhood. Boys will be boys. Uh, how else are you going to grow up to be tough and resilient other than being picked on by a bully? Uh, no one says that anymore. So that kind of trend uh, continuing, and likewise, uh, even, or I shouldn't say likewise, far more important at a global scale, the initiatives to <clears throat> target, stigmatize, shame, demonize violence against women worldwide, violence against gay people worldwide, uh, repugnance of, against war uh, as a rational policy choice, uh, all of those will help. Then um, also the reminding ourselves of what I think of as Hobbes's major insight that government is the most effective re violence reduction technique ever invented, third party justice. Now, of course, there's a sweet spot for government because if government uh, uses too much violence uh, to keep citizens from preying on each other, then the problem is how do you keep citizens from being preyed on by the government? And so reasonably democratic, uncorrupt government, police force, judiciary, uh, that is, stable institutions are, uh, I think, a, 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 the other major force. And that, that might sound like so banal and so obvious, but it, it actually isn't in that, uh, for example, just to take an obvious example, the invasion of Iraq, whose military component was pl planned for meticulously and resulted in a, by the standards of war, fairly low loss of li life in the conduct of the war, but it didn't occur to anyone that if you leave a country in anarchy, if you just knock off the government, you fire everyone with expertise in running the bureaucracy and the police, you leave the country in anarchy, then violent chaos will ensue. So just having good old-fashioned, uh, uncorrupt, minimally effective government is another. Um, and the third thing I would say is education, knowledge, free speech, um, open discourse, channels of communication to keep the momentum of the Enlightenment going. Thank you. Yeah. Do you think it's useful for an individual to try to project the expanding circle uh, as far forward in the future as you can see, both toward animals, as, as Singer encourages, but also to toward the things we have instinctual aversions to, like the Jonathan Haidt examples you mentioned in the blank slate? Yeah, so this is uh, referring to the fact that certain uh, categories of behavior that we often deem to be immoral, indeed punishable, but can't articulate the reasons why. Uh, such as consensual incest, uh, such as desecration of sacred symbols like the flag, um, whether we would have a more tolerant, less peaceful world if we chipped away at our own unjustifiable moral intuitions. Uh, and I think the answer in general is, is yes, that w some of the reductions in violence that I've already uh, alluded to, such as the decriminalization of homosexuality, have come about for exactly that reason, that acts that have seemed to be intuitively repugnant to people uh, are now tolerated rather than punished. Uh, I think that, that an obvious way in which that could continue would be in um, undermining uh, contraband industries, such as drugs and prostitution, where the crimes are 
uh, at least by definition, victimless. It's not that they're, it's, they're consensual interactions if someone decides to take some, uh, smoke some marijuana, uh, and that criminalizing them based on the intuition that these are inherently immoral has led not only to the violence of ballooning the prison population, which is a kind of uh, violence, but perhaps opening up these zones of, uh, of anarchy. So this process, which is basically part of the process of modernity, refining justifying, rationalizing your moral intuitions, often over the uh, very emotional opposition of traditionalists, but I think has been a uh, pacifying force. Thanks, Steve, let's take two more questions, one on each side. Okay, yes. Yes, I wondered if you could address the little asterisk that Peter Singer put on his glowing review of, in the New York Times book review, where he was saying that recent research was indicating that in El Nino years, uh, violence was increasing and that global warming in general might end up leading to a return to violence. Yeah, it, it's certainly possible. And, um, and I, I, I couldn't rule it out. I don't think anyone could. Uh, I would say that it's not inevitable. But um, that study uh, is very indirect because they, they simply correlated um, uh, amount of violence and civil war with the ups and downs of the El Nino cycle and didn't actually subdivide it region by region to show that the region that had the most climate stress had the most subsequent war. And some studies that do that, that just look at climate stress at time one, presence or absence of war at time two, find no correlation. And um, the, the reason is that, uh, assuming that this non-correlation pans out in subsequent studies, is that Violence at the scale of civil war usually requires some kind of organized decision of some government or militia. And uh, that often depends on things very different from resource stress. Many wars have nothing to do with resources whatsoever. Many resource stresses don't result in war, like the Japanese tsunami, the uh, Indonesian tsunami of a couple of years ago, the American Dust Bowl didn't result in a civil war that if you have a country that has ways of responding to uh, climate and resource emergencies, it doesn't automatically get channel uh, channeled into violence. So I wouldn't want to rule it out, nor would I want to say that it's inevitable. And climate change could cause a lot of misery and waste, even if it doesn't cause an increase in violence, per se. Thank you. Yes, finally. Hi. When you said that uh, modern, when you refuted the claim that people uh, who have nostalgic views of how modernization has perhaps maybe increased genocide, when it hasn't, would you say that uh, those claims could have been beneficial in any way for us as a society not wanting those negative things? Mm -hmm. Well, I think... Does that have any effect? I, I think that... Um, I guess I would say no in the sense that it's important to identify the causes of genocide to the extent that we can understand them. And it's hard uh, to establish cause and effect for historical events, simply because the world history unfolds once in our universe, and we don't have access to the full set of parallel universes in which we can <laughs> add up the ones that did and didn't have world wars and genocides the way a scientist would run many runs and, uh, and aggregate them in an experiment. So we're kind of stuck with the only world we have. Uh, but within those limitations, to try to do our best uh, to figure out what really are the causes of genocide and world war, um, I would consider to be the first step in preventing them in the future. So an, it, a misleading theory of what led to World War II uh, I think would not do any good and could even do harm. And the idea that World War II, as, and this is actually not an unpopular theory, was the poisoned fruit of the Enlightenment, and this is what happens when you have people run their own affairs, and we were all better off when we just did what the priests told us to do. Uh, that theory, I think, probably would, would, if anything, do harm rather than good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Once again, you, you can uh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks,